holy apostle Bartholomew. On this day, we commemorate the translation of the relics of St. Bartholomew, although his main feast is celebrated on June 11th. When this great apostle was crucified in Albanopolis in Armenia, Christians removed his body and buried it in a lead sarcophagus. When numerous miracles, especially healings of the sick, occurred over the grave of the apostle, the number of Christians visiting the grave increased. So the pagans took the coffin containing the relics of St. Bartholomew and threw it into the sea. They also threw four more coffins into the sea. These contain, contain the relics of four martyrs, Papian, Lucian, Gregory, and Acacius. However, by God's providence, the coffins did not sink, but floated, and were carried by the current. Acacius to the town of Ascalon, Gregory to Calabria, Lucian to Messina, Papian to the other side of Sicily, and Bartholomew to the island of Lepera. By a miraculous revelation, Agathon, the bishop of Lepera, foresaw the approach of Apostle Bartholomew's relics. Accompanied by other clergy and the people, Agathon came to the seashore to receive the coffin with great joy. Immediately, many of the healings of the sick occurred over the relics of the Holy Apostle. The relics were placed in the church of St. Bartholomew on Lepera and reposed there until the time of Theophilus the Iconoclast. In approximately 839, the Muslims threatened Lepera and the relics of the apostle were translated to Benevento. Thus the Lord glorified his apostle by the miraculous grace bestowed upon him, both during his life and after his death. The Apostle Titus. Titus was one of the 70. He was born in Crete and was educated in Greek philosophy and poetry. Following a vision in a dream, he began reading the prophet Isaiah and lost his faith in Hellenic philosophy. Hearing of Christ the Lord, Titus traveled to Jerusalem with other Cretans, and there he heard the Savior speak and witnessed his mighty acts. He gave his young heart completely to Christ. Later, he was baptized by the Apostle Paul, whom he served like a son to a father in the work of evangelism. Paul loved Titus so much that he referred to him at times as his son and at times as his brother. Titus traveled extensively with the great apostle, and Paul appointed him Bishop of Crete. Titus was present at Paul's suffering and death in Rome and honorably buried the body of his teacher and spiritual father. Afterwards, Titus returned to Crete, where, with great success, he baptized the pagans and where he prudently governed the Church of God until old age. Titus entered into rest at the age of 94. The Holy Confessors of Edessa. They suffered much in prisons and in exile for the, for the Orthodox faith. This was during the reign of the Arian Emperor Valens. Their persecution was lifted under Emperor Theodosius. St. Manus, Patriarch of Constantinople. Manus governed the church wisely from 536 to 552. Before that, he was in charge of the home of St. Samson for the poor and needy. Pope Agathitas, who had come to Constantinople in order to refute and depose the heretical patriarch Anthemus, participated in the consecration of Venus as bishop. It is said that the following miracle occurred in Constantinople during the patriarchate of St. Venus. A Jewish boy went to church with his Christian friends and following their example, received the sacrament of Holy Communion. His father, a glass blower by trade, learned of his son's action and threw him into the superheated kiln that he had prepared for firing glass. The boy remained in the fiery kiln for three days and three nights. When it was finally opened, the boy was alive and healthy, preserved by God's providence.
be gracious to me, the son of mercy upon me. God be gracious to me, the son of mercy upon me. God be gracious unto me, the son of mercy upon me. Forgive me, my brothers and sisters. Forgive me, Father, if you pass the business on. Blessed is our God, always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Come, let us worship and fall down before God our King. Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ our King and our God. Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ himself, our King and our God. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Who covers thyself with light as with a garment? Who has stretched out the heavens like a tent? Who has laid the beams of thy chambers on the waters? Who makest the clouds thy chariot? Who ridest from the wings the wind? Who makest the winds thy messengers? Fire and flame thy ministers? Thou didst set the earth on its foundation, so that it should not be shaken. Thou didst cover it with the deep as with garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the sound of thy thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose. The valleys sank down to the place which thou didst appoint for them. Thou didst set a bound which they should not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. Thou makest springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild asses quench their thirst. By them the birds of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. From thy lofty abode thou waterest the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy work. Thou dost cause the grass to go, grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted. In them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the badgers. Thou hast made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun knows its time for setting. Thou makest darkness, and it is night when all the beasts of the forest creep forth. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they get them away and lie down in their dens. Man goes forth to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works, in wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, which teems with things innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships, and Leviathan, which thou hast formed sport in it. These all look to thee, to give them their food in due season. When thou givest to them, they gather it up. When thou openest thy hand, they are filled with good things. When thou hidest thy face, they are dismayed. When thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created and thou renewest the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles, and touches the mountains, and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have been. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. The sun knows its time for setting. Thou makest darkness, and it is night. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. Glory to, to the, the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Glory to thee, O God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Glory to thee, O God. Alleluia, 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 glory to thee, O God, O our God and our hope, glory to thee. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the good estate of the holy churches of God, and for the union of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for those with faith, reverence, and the fear of God, enter therein, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for our Father, Metropolitan Joseph and our Bishop Anthony, the Honorable Priest of the Diaconate in Christ, for all the clergy and the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the President of the United States and all civil authorities in our armed forces everywhere, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the city of Bloomington, for every city and countryside, and for the faithful who dwell therein, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For helpful seasons, abundance of the fruits of the earth, and peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For travelers by sea, by land, and by air, for the sick and the suffering, for captives and their salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance from all tribulation, wrath, danger, and necessity, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help us, save us, have mercy on us, and keep us, O God, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. Calling to remembrance our all holy immaculate, most blessed and glorious, living and filled with us, and our sins. Let us commend ourselves and each other in all our life unto Christ our God. Run to thee, do all glory, honor, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of the ages. Amen. O Lord, I have cried out unto thee, hear I know 
looked on my right hand and beheld that there was no one that would know me. Wrapped his family, no one cared for my soul. I cried and said, you know what I said, no one could have you said my fortune in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought and known. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may pray thy name. Rise and shall wait for me until thou recompense thee. Of the death, so I cried unto thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let her ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Thou Lord, just mark every door to the sun, for thee there is forgiveness. Let us bless with sincerity the bright sun shining brightly, and the living heaven that clearly doth declare the saving glory of God, the preaching truly in spite of God, glorious Bartholomew. Whom the nations on earth possess as their guiding star, who is truly an ever plowing river that doth pour forth streams of knowledge and richly water the hearts of all.
unto the Son, unto the Holy Spirit. Though dead for many years, O famed Bartholomew, coming out of the east, thou did set thy swift course in the sea, and thy paths in many waters. For the righteous live forever, for the, by the providence of thy teacher. Of 
faithful guide, a guardian of our souls and bodies, let us ask of the Lord. Grant his Lord. Pardon and remission of our sins and transgressions, let us ask of the Lord. Grant his Lord. All things good are profitable for our souls and peace for the world, let us ask of the Lord. Grant his Lord. That we may complete the remaining time of our life in peace and repentance, let us ask of the Lord. Grant this, O Lord. Christian, ending to our life, painless, blameless, and peaceful, and the good defense before the dread judgment seat of Christ, let us ask of the Lord. Grant this, O Lord. Calling to remembrance are all of whom we immaculate, most blessed and glorious lady, the ourselves and each other in all our life unto Christ our God. To be, o Lord. With our good God who loves mankind and unto thee do we ascribe glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Peace be to all. To thy Let us bow our heads unto the Lord. To thee, o, Lord. o Lord our God, who didst bow the heavens and come down for the salvation of mankind, but look upon thy servants and upon thine inheritance. For unto thee, the fearful judge, we have us mankind, and thy servants bow their heads, and submissively incline to their necks, awaiting not help from men, but entreating thy mercy and looking confidently for thy salvation. Guard them at all times, both during this present evening and in the approaching night, from every enemy, from all adverse powers of the devil, from vain thoughts and from evil imaginations. Blessed and glorified be the majesty of thy kingdom, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. The harmonious harp of the apostles, moved by the Holy Spirit, hath abolished the rights of abominable demons. And proclaiming that one Lord, it hath delivered the nations from the error of idols, and hath taught us to worship the Trinity in one essence. Their sound hath gone forth into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Let us acclaim with one voice the whole apostolic choir, Peter and Paul and Andrew, Luke and Thomas with Philip, Matthew and Bartholomew, James, Mark, and John. Zealous Simon, the Canaanite, and let us worthily praise the whole company of disciples with the befitting him. Wondrous is God in his saints, O lauded martyrs of the Lord. Lo, the earth concealed you not, but rather heaven received you. And the gates of paradise welcomed you and opened. And as ye now dwell therein, ye joyfully partake of the tree of life. Thus intercede, we pray, with the Master, even Christ the Lord, that he grant peace and great mercy to our souls. Glory to the Father, and, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Thou becamest a disciple of the vessel of election, all the God proclaimer, and initiated by him into the divine doctrine. Thou wast sent unto the nations to turn them to faith and to enlighten them with the splendor of thy words. 
Wherefore thou didst run to the ends of the world, O Apostle Titus, preaching unto all the good tidings of the incarnate God. Whom do thou now entreat, that those who keep thine ever venerable memorial, when it faith may be saved? Both now and ever, and unto ages of ages, amen. O Virgin, holy, free of blame, entreat him who was born of thee to take pity on my poor and hapless soul. And at the hour of judgment, in his surpassing goodness, to rank me with the portion of the upon us, O God, according to thy great mercy, we pray thee, hearken and have mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Okay. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Then we pray for all pious and orthodox Christians. Metropolitan Joseph and our Bishop Anthony. Again, we pray for our brethren, the priest deacons, and monastics, and for all our brotherhood in Christ. Again, we pray for mercy, life, peace, health, salvation, visitation. 
pardon and remission of sins, especially for the servant of God, Don Andrew, and for D. Tabitha, for the servants of God, the priest Basil and Jerome, for Deacon Sergius, Deacon Lawrence, Marcia, Perpetua, Anna, Michael, Olga, I mean, Soren, Serafina, Allison, Marvin, Stephen, Anna, Xenia, Faith, Alicia, Mary Ann, Thomas, Vicky, Olga, Daniel, and Nora, Joel and the child she bears, Mallory and the child she bears, Tabitha and the child she bears, Megan and the child she bears, Martha, Galina, and Matus, Raisa, for Michael, Zach, Noah, the Harvey Missionary family, for Kirby, Janet, Jeff, Nelson, Andrew, Penny, Theodora, Josh, David, Ken, Judy, Nathan, Kelly, Doug, Christina, Aiden, the servants of God suffering the war in Ukraine, the catechumens and inquirers of the Holy Orthodox faith especially, Ken, Kenny, Ian, Ian, Wyatt, Michael, Michael, Zephaniah, Elias, Jacob, Rick, Emma, David, Heather, James, Nicholas, Alice, Justin, Jeremy, Stephen, Ashley, Evelyn, Timothy, Philip, Pauline, Kelsey, Tim, Sue, Hayden, Avery, Sammy, Bridget, Stephen, John, Godfrey, Thomas, Stephanie, and for, for all Orthodox Christians of true worship who live and dwell in this community. Again, we pray for the blessed and ever memorable founders of this holy church, for the servants of God, the newly departed Metropolitan Callistos, Archpriest Dwayne, Deacon Richard, Matushka Ann, Joyce, Vi, Eric, Kevin, and Bob, and for all our fathers and brethren, the Orthodox part of the site before us, and here in all the world, lie asleep in the Lord. Again, we pray for those who bear fruit and do good works in this holy and all venerable temple, for those who serve and those who sing, and for all the people here present who await thy great and rich mercy. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Thou art a merciful God, and lovest mankind, and unto thee we ascribe glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Wisdom. Amen. Christ our God, the existing one, is blessed and always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Saints Nicholas, Archbishop of Myra and Lycia, the wonder worker of the holy and righteous ancestors of God, Joachim and Anna, of the holy, glorious, all laudable apostles Bartholomew and Titus, of our holy fathers Manus, Epiphanius, Gennadios, and John, Archbishops of Constantinople, of our father among the saints, Cosmas the Aetolian, whose memory we celebrate, and of all the saints, the patrons, and protectors of our holy community. Have mercy upon us and save us for as much as he is good and loves mankind. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy upon us and save us. Amen. Amen. 
Christ is in our midst. Yes, in our midst. Uh, just a, uh, a quick announcement for everyone's uh, information and prayers that uh, it looks like Dawn Andrew Haney uh, suffered a mild heart attack today. Oh. And so he's in the hospital uh, in Bedford. Apparently has a great heart doctor, so that's a good thing. Uh, and so please keep he and D Tabitha in your prayers. Uh, and God willing, I will be going down tomorrow morning to, to visit them. So pray for them. Uh, he's down in Bedford Hospital. Um, secondly, for those who keep very close watch on the calendar and think that I made an error at the dismissal, I know nobody was watching that closely. Uh, St. Cosmas the Aetolian, we celebrated him today. Uh, and so I commemorated him because he's one of my favorites. You know, when you have, if somebody said to you, you know, you could have an hour with like five saints, who would they be? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, it's hard to, you know, it's really hard to say, oh boy, you know, I mean, which would those be? It's, it's, it's hard to answer that question, but I know for me, you know, uh, St. Peter the Apostle, of course, you know, my patron saint, St. John of San Francisco, I'd have to have him in there. St. John of Kronstadt, there'd be a lot of Johns in the room. Uh, and and St. Cosmas would be on the short list. Um, because, and I know, by the way, it's tonight, it's not, it's, it's uh, Ask of Luna, but I just have to say a word about him. I was reading about him again today. That's the thing, you know, if you read a saint's story, you should never just read it once and then be like, oh, I know all about him, you know, uh, because you should read different versions of saint's stories because some people leave out details that other people, well, other people put in. And what struck me today, it's not that I hadn't heard this before, but it struck me today that, you know, his story in brief was, was he, uh, he went to Mount Athos to study at the age of 20, and then he ended up becoming a monk, and then he went to study rhetoric, I believe, in Constantinople. And while he was there, he received the blessing from the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople to become basically an apostle to the Greek people. And which sounds crazy, like an apostle to the Greek people, why didn't he do that? Well, they were under the Turkish yoke. The Greeks were not allowed to learn anything about Christianity, right? There was this great oppression on them. They weren't allowed to, to hear preaching. They weren't allowed to uh, be teaching each other. There was, um, it was a very, very oppressive time. And when he saw the ignorance of the people, he was moved to compassion and decided that he wanted to devote his life to bringing the gospel to them, to bringing Christ to them, to reminding them of the teachings of their fathers and forefathers uh, to remind them uh, the importance of being in the church, understanding the theology, the understanding, um, uh, and understanding as much as we are able to about God. And so, this is what he did. And he traveled around, and you know, as he went, he would plant a giant cross in the middle of the town, wherever the village where he was going, and he would tell people. He'd start to preach, and he'd say, "I'm going to be serving liturgy here tonight," you know, or "I'm going to be." Uh, preaching here this evening or whatever and, and he he brought life back to to Greece it's strange to think about that you know he brought he brought back the life of the church one man with the guidance and of the Holy Spirit with the prayers of the Saints with the help of those around who were quietly willing to help him at the risk of their own lives uh, this man he went and he did whatever it took to make sure people heard the gospel. And, <clears throat> you know, it struck me recently in talking to people, and I mean, you can see this in polls too, about people's based basically their ignorance of the scriptures and their ignorance of the church, of theology, of doctrine. You know, I mean, if you hang around with people who like to talk about such things, you're like, oh, what are you talking about? I know people at school, and we talk about, you know, the saints and this and that. But at large, people just don't know anymore. They know we've lost them, really. I mean, they just don't, they don't know. You, it's amazing to me, you know, if you're in the grocery store and you talk to somebody and, you know, and maybe you mention Jonah, and then someone's like, Jonah? So you know the belly of the whale? Is that in the Old Testament? Yeah, that's in the Old Testament. Right. You mention people and, and figures and theological concepts that we think are relatively, 
you know, just, just elementary. And the average people just don't have it. It's just gone. So the reason I bring that up is because St. Cosmas, when he saw that state among his people, he dropped everything. He learned anything and everything he had to. He studied rhetoric for a reason. Why do you think he left Mount Athos and went to go study under the great rhetoricians? Why? Because he wanted to be able to communicate the gospel. And then he devoted the rest of his life until his martyrdom, which he was martyred, for 20 years of quietly slipping under the radar and preaching the gospel to the people in Greece and Albania. Uh, for 20 years of preaching the gospel, he received martyrdom at the hands of the Muslims. So uh, anyway, while we have a free country, you know, it, it, it would be a good idea for us to have his prayers and a little bit of his fervor, realizing that people around us, I mean, there are so many people around us who would probably love to know God, but nobody's taught them. Um, who would not love to understand the scriptures. But, you know, do you remember as a child ever trying to open the Bible? One of my kids asked me the other night, Dad, can I read the Bible? I said, sure. But you open it up and you start reading, and you're like, what does this mean? Right? It can be hard to get through it. Because they need someone to explain it. And they need someone to live it. Right? So, anyway, I would just encourage you all, read the life of St. Cosmas the Aetolian, and uh, ask him to pray for you and to pray for us, both as a community and as a church, uh, because it's so important you know, if, if, if we don't bear witness to the light of the gospel, who's going to? You know, if we don't bring the church to people, who's going to? It's our job, it's our calling, it's our gift. So, through his prayers, may we all do that. <clears throat> uh, so tonight, 10 minutes on the clock, we're going to have a little bit of Ask Abuna. Um, Wendy, Elizabeth, I forgot to send out that text, but I will send it out. I've got it opened on my computer right now. She asked a question last week. Why did Mary say, don't hold me? When, uh, why did Jesus say to Mary at the tomb, don't hold me? I have not yet ascended to my father. Why did he say that? And so uh, I told her I had something I read that was written on it that I would send out. I have it yet, so I'll send it out. Mary Amadeo. I'm bored. What should I do? Pray. Good question. Or as Grandma used to tell me, you could clean your room if you're bored. I know. You can clean my office. <laughs> yes, sir, Jeremy. Is the uh, Metropolitan Callistos Callisto Square? Yes. Oh, blessed memory. Martha. Um, I was talking, my niece along the way here was talking about a few things and some passages and stuff, and this is kind of a question for her. Um, in John... Uh, nine, they uh, about the man born blind and sees, and the disciples ask uh, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? She's having a hard time at work trying to figure out why they would ask that, and which would it be? I mean, is what would be they? Why would they ask that of them? Is was he are you born with sin or? It's uh, a great question. Yeah, so, um, Can you repeat that? sure, thank you. So the question is, when Jesus um, came to the blind man and the disciples asked him, they said, who sinned to this man or his parents that he was born blind, right? And Jesus responds, what? Yeah, don't close it that quick. <laughs> <laughs> I have it right, uh, uh, it's something about Sorry to put you up. And neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Right. Neither this man nor his parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So why did they? Why did? Why did the disciples ask who sinned, this man or his parents? Um, so there's this. Uh, there there is this teaching. Well, let's just say we'll go back to Genesis. Uh, we we'll go back to the beginning, and. <clears throat> When, when Adam and Eve sin, God tells them what is going to be the consequence of their sin. And he talks about all these things, you know, working and toil and, and, and uh, sweating, you know, plowing the land uh, and, and, you know, women in childbirth, that there is this travail. Um, and 
And when we look at the way salvation history, uh, uh, the way history itself in the scriptures plays out, we see that the sins of the fathers are visited upon the, the other generations. In other words, we have things called generational sin. Um, we have effects of sin that, the, the, you know, that, that an entire family can be affected by the effect of, uh, by the sin of, of a, an ancestor. And it's not that that can't ever be broken, by the way. It's not that we, well, I'm just this way because my great-grandfather was this way, you know. It's not that it's an excuse for sin, uh, but some people are born with a propensity to a certain sin, or some people have the effect of, of, of the sin of their parents. When I was in Alaska, a lot of children, for example, had fetal alcohol syndrome, right? So the mother was pregnant, she drinks a lot, and what happens? The child comes out with these various difficulties, you know, birth defects and things. Um, <clears throat> So in, in Jesus' day, it was very much uh, understood that if there was some sort of a disability, that it was, be, it was the effect of, of, a, of a sin, uh, either of the parents or of the person who was suffering. So, for example, when uh, Jesus heals the paralytic and he says to him, go and sin no more. You know, it's this idea that he said, go, go and sin no more, lest something worse befall you. Right? So sometimes when we sin, we bring uh, the effects of the sin not only uh, mentally or psychologically on ourselves or spiritually, but also it has a physiological effect. Um, so anyway, so the, the question simply because, uh, because either there is an effect of his ancestor's sin, his parents, for example, or of his own, but obviously if he's born blind, it wasn't his own sin. But well, that's what she was saying, if he right. was born but she. I think her thing was, why would they ask that if he was born mm -hmm. blind? Would that not be a given that it was not him that sinned, but his parents? That's where. <laughs> yeah, the only reason I would speculate is, is that you know uh, on that, and this is just my speculation. I, I I did read a commentary on this probably th two or three months ago, and I can't remember where it was. Um, but but if you know God foreknowing his sin, you know if he suffered the effects of of his sin because of God's foreknowledge, but. I don't, and that would just be a guess. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Nicholas. What do you mean when you say we're the body of Christ? We're the body of Christ? Oh, what a great question. You asked the good ones too. Okay, so what do you mean, uh, what do we mean by, by saying that we're the body of Christ? So, uh, wow, that's a good question. So Jesus, um, Jesus is the bridegroom. And uh, we, the church, are the bride. And this goes all the way back to the Old Testament, even before Jesus, where, uh, where, where uh, God looks at his people, the nation of Israel, he, he looks at them as his bride. And um, so when we say that we're the body of Christ, uh, you know how it says in the Bible that uh, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, uh, and the two shall become one flesh, and what God has brought together, no, let no man put asunder. Uh, because we are the bride of Christ, because we have communion with Christ, and he is the groom, then we talk about ourselves as being the body of Christ, because the two become one flesh, right? It, it's a, and St. Paul says, it's a great mystery, but I'm speaking about Christ and the church. So, to, just if I, I could just re-answer the question and just say, it's a great mystery. Uh, but that's how I explain it. As best as I can, Victoria. Okay, so I guess maybe a little bit connected. Um, Christ, when he's uh, refuting the Sadducees about the woman with seven husbands, yes. um, he says to them that in the resurrection they are neither married nor given in marriage. So obviously they're not given in marriage because we're not called to the same actions that we are in this life. But does that mean, like, but then why are people crowned together? Like eternally, if they're not married. That's a great mystery. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> why are, why do we? Uh, if Jesus says in heaven they're neither in the kingdom of heaven they're neither, neither married nor given in marriage, right? Then uh, why do we have these crowns that await us until the kingdom? It is a great mystery. Um, but when we when we understand Jesus' words, first of all, he's he's explaining in such a way where we will not look forward to kind of um, three, two cats in the yard sort of n n normal marriage, right? In other words, 
it's uh, it, what we have in the kingdom is is not what we have here. This is just a foreshadowing. The marriage that we have with a spouse is an icon of the of the of the marriage of Christ in the church, right? So what Saint Paul just 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 said. Um, so we understand that first of all that that Christ is letting us know that the marriage that we have in heaven is, doesn't look like this, right? But we also confess that there is a bond that takes place here that is not dissolved in death. It's something that, that continues on. Um, and so there, there is this mystical marriage of the kingdom. Beyond that, I can't explain it. Okay? I know that that's what we confess, but we can't, I, I, I can't put into words what that would look like. I don't know. But that is our confession, that marriage does not end at death, but that it continues on. Anybody who's not asked, did you already ask a question? Did you, Hannah, did you ask a question yet tonight? No, no. No, okay, Hannah. Um, so, uh, when Christ was going to be crucified, and Pontius Pilate's wife told him, I have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I suffer over much in a dream. Yep. You said she was having, like, a vision? Um, she was, yeah, she, she was having, I mean, she was having a dream, yeah. She was, God had sent her. Uh, there was a visitation in her sleep, yes. Um, so, uh, did she become a saint? Yes. And do we have an icon of her? Not in the church. She is St. Lydia, is that right? Is that her name? Procla. Procla? Procla, is that it? Procla. Procla, thank you. Yes, her name is Procla. Okay. And yes, she's, she became a saint. Was she a martyr and... Um, did Pontius Pilate ever find out she was like a Christian or whatever? Yeah, okay. So I don't remember if she was martyred. Do you remember? I don't remember if St. Procla was martyred. Uh, yes, we have a book, a booklet. It's called Letters of St. Procla. Is that what it's called? Letters to Pilate. What is it called? I, Do you remember? I have a book at home. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I read it in Alaska, so it's been a few years. Uh, uh, but yes, she writes back and forth with Pontius Pilate, and um, she's encouraging him to become a Christian. I mean, it's this beautiful, she obviously cares about him very deeply, but she's caring about his salvation. Um, so there's this, it's, I think it's called Letters to Pilate. I believe that's the one that I read. Um, so yes, good question. I don't remember if she was martyred. You could probably look it up. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. What is the process exactly of deciding on sainthood? Like, who gets it? Who votes on it? Or Great do question. Vote on it, or do it's, they... No. So, yeah, well, it's a very ours is a very more organic approach. Okay. So, you you've got like the big saints where you'll, you know, by the time they die, everybody knows they're just waiting to make them saints. You know, I mean, like honestly, that's kind of what happened with the Athenite elders. You know, they died. Everybody already knew they were saints. They were already you know, working miracles and have all these spiritual gifts and everything. And it was just a matter of time before everybody did what we knew was coming. And I remember when they died and just waiting for, okay, when are we going to canonize them, right? Or, or glorify them as, as saints in the church. Um, but then there's also kind of the, the very much more the organic approach, like you see with local saints, saints of local veneration. Uh, for example, one that we have right now is uh, Saint, uh, well, excuse me, Blessed Olga of Alaska, um, and she is, when we have an icon of her here, it, uh, she already has an icon, uh, 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 she's not supposed to have a halo yet, but she does, um, she has a halo, and, uh, but typically what you would have is you'd have an icon of them that didn't have a halo yet until they're glorified as saint, and then they put the halo on it, but what's happened is, um, in, within the last 20 years, um, she appeared to somebody, uh, in a, a dream or a series of dreams and, um, and, and and helped to heal this woman and then finally revealed who she was. And so that started all this research into who is this woman that visited me in my dream and brought, I mean, she gave her her name and everything. She'd never heard of her. So she starts researching back in Alaska and finds out that there's this miraculous Korea or a Matushka that lived up there 
who was a, a midwife and, and just a pretty amazing story. So that's so there's a local veneration of her in Alaska and among certain people in America. And as it spreads, eventually it'll get to the bishops and the bishops will make a decision for glorification. Unless somebody has a really good reason why it wouldn't happen. So that's just a good example. Uh, Catherine. Was she a native Alaskan? Yeah, she was native Alaskan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she might have been half Russian, half, uh, half Plinkin. What was that? Was it Aliu? Was she Aliu? She might have been Aliu. Yes, yeah, she was on the Aleutians, that's right. Aliou? Yep. What was that? I just was looking up Pontius Pilate's wife. It's oh. Claudia Procula, P-R-O-C-U-L-A. Okay. okay. Procula. Um, she anyway, a... I haven't found anything more about whether she was martyred. Okay. I did see. That's, I, I was waiting <laughs> to. I see something that said she had, had been martyred. Okay. And another example, of, by the way, just another example of this, uh, who is this, this uh, what is his name, Brother is it Brother Munoz or Brother Juan Munoz, I cannot remember. Oh, anyway, he would, was from Chicago and would travel with this icon, this, this, this weeping, uh, miraculous icon of the Theotokos, and as he was, I believe he was in Greece traveling with the icon, uh, and he was slain in his hotel room. Uh, and, and, you know, so he's another one that if you look up American saints, there's a list of American saints waiting to be glorified and he's on that list. So it's just a process, but it's usually not top down in Orthodox. Usually it's bottom up. So would the ecumenical patriarch eventually recognize such a person? So usually what happens is it would be one synod of bishops for example, it could be the Antiochians. Uh, it could be in America, it was the OCA, for example, who first re recognized St. Raphael of Brooklyn, right? And then, of course, the Antiochians said, yes, we recognize him as well. He's one of ours, right? Uh, and, and then, the, you know, the Greeks and then everybody else kind of, they begin to add him to their list of saints. Question. We don't wait for the ecumenical patriarch. That's, if we were Roman Catholic, we'd wait for the Pope's last word, but, but not an Orthodox. Okay, I think that's 10 minutes. Ooh, that's 10 minutes plus. Tatiana. Ta okay, Tatiana, this is your bonus round. Does Mary have a last name? That's a really great question. Does Mary, the Theotokos, have a last name? Yeah, so Howard, I'm going to ask you a technical question. With women, do they get the last name of their, do they, does their last name come from their father as it does with men? For example, Bar Zechariah. I do you know? Can't give me a good answer. Okay. If she was a man, her last name would be Bar Zechariah. I don't know if that works the same way with women. I'm not sure how that works. I'll see that question with Bar Zechariah is a name or just an identifier. Right. Yeah. Good question, though. That was a real good question. No. No double bonus. All right. God bless you all. So pray for Don and Dee. Uh, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you all this weekend. Apparently she was a martyr. She was martyred. I mean, there's an icon of her at the cross. Okay. St. Procla. The OCA um, has an article. Oh, good. But I can't, you know.